next from the vault. Ice as far as the eye can see. Roads closed, lights, and heat off in some places for days. Plus, the sun sets on central Illinois in the middle of the day. It's an out-of-this-world eclipse that had everyone looking to the skies. All that, a trip back in time to the early days of the Assembly Hall and a WCIA personality goes Hollywood. Gosh, <laughs> I want to take you back to Champaign. <laughs> right now, from the vault. The stories that made news and made history, the places that matter to us, and the people who make Central Illinois home. Join us from the vault. Great to have you along with us from the vault. I'm Matt McCaff. No matter what time of year, big weather is big news. Imagine being trapped, in some cases for days, inside your home without heat or electricity in the dead of winter. As Win Smiley reports, there was no love for Mother Nature. As some people celebrated Valentine's Day, 1990. Central Illinois lay stunned this morning as daylight revealed the extent of a night of falling ice. There's obviously an emergency out there. There are hundreds of downed wires all over the community. Don't be walking around your neighborhood. That's crazy at this point in time. Police and firefighters could not keep up with the flood of calls overnight down power lines and trees and problems with natural gas leaks. Most city emergency workers are on the job for extended schedules. Makes a long, probably a long two or three days. After spending the night wondering what was really going on outside, drivers discovered this morning that down trees had replaced icy roads as the major hazard. For many, the night produced more problems than a few hours of cleanup can solve. Trees in their limbs, damaging cars, breaking windows, and scarring houses. First, we didn't know what was happening. We'd heard this, this gigantic kaboom on the ceiling. I thought it was maybe a, like a, a tank or something blowing up far away, and then I realized something was hitting our ceiling. We went out and saw all the logs on the ceiling, on the, on the roof. Uh, you said one went through your roof and into the Yeah, water. we thought that was it. We had a few you know, limbs, and then I'm sitting there in the easy chair, and <laughs> there's another one, and it's right over my head, and, and a branch had come through the, the living room ceiling. What did you think when you walked out this morning? And surveyed the damage. Incredible. Jack said, Jack's lived here for a long time. He said, uh, 1953 is as far back as he can remember before they've had a storm. You know, this, 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 uh, impressive. <laughs> At the worst part of the storm, more than 50,000 people were without power. Now, ice can be terrifying. Other earth science phenomenon, fascinating. Like a total eclipse. <laughs> It wasn't that long ago that we all donned our eclipse glasses to see a total solar eclipse, the first visible from most of the United States in decades. People lined up around the block at the Champaign Public Library for free glasses and joined friends, neighbors, and total strangers for a peek. The last time it happened was 1979, and George Bryant was on the University of Illinois campus to see how the eclipse brought community together. About 80% of the solar eclipse could be seen over central Illinois. Around mid-morning, many observers could be found flopped around telescopes. Some braved the cold weather and stood in long lines just to get a peek, while others huddled inside planetariums to view the eclipse on a larger screen. For some, it was the first time they have ever seen an eclipse. I think it's exciting because it's something different. It's unusual. It doesn't happen every day. We'll probably never see it again. Are you looking forward to seeing this? Yeah. <laughs> My um, professor canceled class to see it, so I think that's a good reason. Almost at the back of the line. Yeah, are you skipping classes to come see this eclipse? Well, I hope I don't have to. I have to go be there in 10 minutes. And I hope I don't have to miss class, but I will. Is that important to you? Well, I want to see it. I saw the last one. I think I was 10 years old at the time, and I don't want to miss this one. It's kind of, it's partially round, but there's sort of a piece cut out of the side. Um, it's kind of strange. They said there won't be another one for several years, so I wanted to see it. The weather for the most part was good. It was almost a perfect day to view the eclipse with a telescope, although sometimes turbulence in the upper atmosphere blurred the picture. The eclipse lasted for about two and a half hours, and if you were outside during the height of the eclipse, you may have noticed that the sky was a little darker than usual. 
This will be the last solar eclipse visible over North America for this century. The next one will not occur until the year 2016, and that also will probably draw as much attention. George Bryant, Channel 3 News, Champaign. So George in that story says 2016, but you have to remember back in 1979, 2016 or 2017 seemed way far off, right? So you've all heard the phrase orange and blue through and through. Well, we're going to show you some really collectible Illini gear coming up from the vault. But next, I journey back in time in more ways than one, a lost landmark that tells the early story of central Illinois. From the Vault, celebrating the rich heritage of Central Illinois. Sponsored by Sunset Funeral Homes. Remember, celebrate, heal. Most of the official Abraham Lincoln sites tell the story of his law career or when he began to run for political office. But if you were to take the unofficial tour, you might go to where he got frostbite or where he kicked back to enjoy a beer with good friends. Both of those stories were part of the 33 Mile House in Blue Mound Township outside Decatur. Channel 3's Mike Jackson takes us there in this story from the vault, 1968. Time, that mystical measure of the difference between then and now, has its way with houses. In 1833, this was the pioneer home of William Warnick, the first sheriff of Macon County. But through the years, a man's fancy changes. He adds clapboard to cover 14-inch thick log walls, and he adds a porch and dormers. So that today, the Warnick House stands as the oldest house in Macon County. The Warnick Homestead grew from 40 acres in 1824 to twice its size, 80 acres, 10 years later, a tract of land south of the Sangamon River in what has now become Macon County. Warnick's great-great-granddaughter, Mrs. Hazel Weatherford, described the house and the changes which have taken place in the 132 years since it was built. The original four log rooms are still there, and that was the way it was at that time. And then as it, from generation to generation, it has been, oh, what you'd say, remodeled, and the weatherboarding put on, and it's been plastered. But on the inside, the plastering is off, and you can see the log rooms. There's four of them, pretty good-sized rooms. The house is less than three miles from the home in which Abraham Lincoln lived with his family for a year before moving on to New Salem near Springfield. During that time, he became friends with the sheriff and received his first exposure to the law while reading in Warnick's extensive collection of law books. The home also played an important part in the development of early Illinois. The old Terre Haute Springfield Road, which connected the Cumberland Pike to East Central Illinois, passed in front of this house. The John Echo family, which obtained the house from Warnink after a lawsuit, converted part of it into a tavern to serve the westward tide of emigration. Known as the 33 Mile House, because it was 33 miles from Springfield, the tavern offered food, drink, and overnight lodging to early Illinois travelers and served them well till the mid-1850s when the railroads drew off much of the road's traffic. Since then, additions have been constructed and the house has been home to a stream of families. It was occupied until only a few years ago. Although it's changed greatly in outward appearance since the first rough-hewn beams were laid on large stones and the first mud and limestone mortar was chinked between the log walls, the spirit of early Illinois is still present in the Warnick House. Now there is renewed hope the house may be restored to serve as a tribute to the early settlers of central Illinois. This is Mike Jackson. The Warnick House was lost to a fire about a decade after that story first aired. However, Blue Mound Township continues to maintain a cemetery right near there where several local families are buried. Still ahead for you, collecting your green stamps for savings. Also coming up, the assembly hall and the early days of the saucer on the prairie.
You may not know it, but when you're sitting in the assembly hall, you are sitting in one of the most architecturally significant arenas in the world. Back in the day, it used to be called the Flying Saucer on the Prairie, and its construction was an architectural feat. It was like nothing central Illinois or the world had ever seen. It is uh, unique uh, for the latter half of the uh, 20th century. The massive domed structure broke the prairie horizon and broke in a new day for Illinois sports. For more than 25 years, U of I's basketball team called Huff Hall home. Former basketball star Dave Downey remembers the games at Huff as intimate. If you were going to take the ball out of bounds, you had to ask the fans to you know, move their feet so that you could stand and throw it in. But the building couldn't accommodate the growing number of fans, so the university chose Illini alum Max Abramowitz to create a new facility, not only larger, but unique. A great number of architects, including myself, worship the Gothic period when the builders just built of stone and the stone held things up and it had its own majesty. The task was as huge as the building itself. Crews poured tons of concrete, forming stands for 16,000 fans. The roof posed a particular challenge, as Dick Foley of Felmley Dickerson Construction explained to then WCIA sports director Tom Shandienst. Tom, the main feature is the roof structure, which is 400 feet in diameter without a post in the place. To hold it up, machines wrapped 614 miles of quarter-inch steel wire around the outer edge of the building 2,500 times. Central Illinois laborers worked nearly around the clock to complete it. Finally, four years and $8 million later, Assembly Hall hosted its first basketball game on March 3, 1963. Downey says the new arena was almost too different for the players. Everyone was kind of in awe of the place. The fans, they had not been able to suspend the baskets in a way that worked very well, so the, they were much springier than the nice old baskets in Huff. And uh, the lighting, the sound, the remoteness of the crowd, it was very much like a neutral court. But that didn't stop Downey from breaking the Illini scoring record that first night at Assembly Hall. The hall was the first major arena in central Illinois, unique in 1963, unique in 2003. Then, as now, it provides a venue that uh, is unavailable outside of the city, outside of Chicago, Indianapolis, St. Louis. In Champaign, Matt Metcalf, 3 News. Dave Downey, whom I interviewed there, was a major contributor to the rehabilitation of the hall back in 2017. The naming rights for the arena were sold to help cover the rest of the $150 million price tag. So nothing gets Illini fans in the orange and blue spirit, right? Like a trip to the playoffs. And the Illini football team went to the Rose Bowl back in 1983. And as a result, there was all kinds of fresh, fun Illini swag there to behold. PM Magazine's Steve Trainer and Suzanne Kay did a little shopping. There's been a massive outbreak all across central Illinois. That's right. It's even spread north towards Chicago. It's Illini fever. Sporadic cases of Illini fever have been reported in the past, but never in such epidemic proportions. Illini fever can strike anyone at any time. And the symptoms include, now pay attention, periods of wild hysteria, a fondness for Indian war chants, and even a craving for animal pelts such as wildcats, badgers, and the infamous wolverine. But the telltale sign of a patient with this malady is love of the colors orange and blue. So to appease the appetites of these fevered thousands, articles made of orange and blue are being made available in outlets throughout the area.
And then there is the remedy for that close to terminal case of Illini fever, a hand-carved chess set with figurines of Chief Illiniwick, football players, and even Mike White himself. Doctors say there is no cure for Illini fever, though many are recommending a long vacation someplace warm, say Pasadena. A University of Illinois alumnus, WCIA's Jennifer Roscoe, visits the set of a long-running, top-rated soap opera. See if you recognize any of the actors, or Jennifer, next. The stories and people you remember from Central Illinois. Once again, From the Vault with Matt Metcalf. Some television shows seem timeless, and The Young and the Restless on CBS is one of those shows. So when our own Jennifer Roscoe got the opportunity to go behind the scenes in Genoa City, she was on the next plane. Check it out, From the Vault, 1998. The drama based in the Midwestern town of Genoa City revolves around the lives of the Newmans, the Chancellors, and the Abbots. It's become the most successful soap in history, remaining the top daytime drama for more than 500 consecutive weeks. What's the secret? Photographer Nathan Halder and I went to Hollywood to find out. Inside CBS Television City is a place filled with tension, greed, lust and love. It's the world of the young and the restless and millions of viewers are hooked. The proof? The soap has been the number one daytime show since 1988. I think it starts with uh, uh, you know the bones of the the operation the, the, the story rolling and speeding it is a relationship based show we don't uh, we're not freezing poor Charles and there's no uh, you know there's no space invaders or anything like this. Uh, we basically come back to uh, human interaction. And the storylines keep viewers coming back. We've started putting romance back in it again. And um, that's what the audience likes. The audience really likes to be romantic. They also like to make a connection to the characters. Viewers have been watching Eric Braden play millionaire Victor Newman for almost two decades. Okay, and that's the end. Let's take it. If there's one thing that keeps one going outside of the money is, um, is the fact that you know you entertain people. That's why when you are on a successful show, you should damn well stay on it. And many actors have followed suit. Over 50% have been here 10 years. So there's uh, continuity and consistency. How's 25 years for consistency? That's how long original cast member Jeannie Cooper has been playing matriarch Catherine Chancellor. You have this chance to create this other person. You know, and uh, if there's something that happens, I'll always blame it on her. You know, she, she made me do it. <laughs> I didn't do that. Jasmine did that. You know. Don't believe anything she <laughs> says. Say. And if the actors love the characters they play, the fans love them more. Jess Walton found that out during a trip to see her mother-in-law in Danville. Two days before Christmas, we went to the mall. I couldn't move. I mean, somebody would scream Jill, everyone would turn around, and they would just come. And, um, and it was really hard to get any shopping done whatsoever. So the next day, we put me in disguise. Within 20 seconds of me entering, even with this coat on and this hat, this big old hat, they said she's here, and they, they came. So how did Roscoe do? Well, check it out. But I was tired of standing on the sidelines. I wanted to see what it's really like under the lights. Five, four, three, two. You're going to walk across here? Yep, that's me as an extra at Gina's. We're following you. Five, four, three, two. I had to walk, drink, clap, and get this, dance. Okay, here we go, in. Five, four. If the actor's lines go smoothly, they'll tape just once. But until they get it right, we do it yeah, over just... and over. In between, I got Gosh. a little tampering. <laughs> I want to take you back to Champagne. <laughs> it was an experience I'll never forget.
Do you have your scissors handy? It's time to do a little coupon clipping with WCIA's Dave Phillips. This week, join Eisner's S&H Stampede. It's a big coupon sale that brings you free S&H green stamps in addition to those you receive with each 10 cent purchase. Look in tonight's Eisner ad in your local newspaper. Here are some of the coupon specials you'll find. With a quart of Dean's Buttermilk and a coupon, you'll receive 25 extra free S&H green stamps. Dean's is the buttermilk with real butter flakes added. It has a zesty tang for summer refreshment. With a six-pack carton of RC Cola and the coupon, you'll receive another 25 extra free S&H green stamps. Try RC for that light, fresh flavor. With a twin pack of Kelly's potato chips and the coupon, you'll receive 50 extra free S&H green stamps. Serve one and keep one fresh in the Kelly twin pack. Kelly's the chip with zip. You'll find many, many more coupon specials in tonight's Eisner ad. Clip them out and take them along to your Eisner store for those extra free S&H green stamps. It's another example of how you can do better at Eisner. I do love those old-time commercials. That'll do it for us from the vault. Thanks for watching, everyone. Glad you could join us on this trip down memory lane. I'm Matt Metcalf. We'll see you next time.